it's just a waiting game, really. If you can buy it, break even leverage and good rental markets where there's going to be uh, demand drivers and eventual employment drivers back on the horizon and some level of supply constraint, I think you're going to be a huge winner five, six years from now. And that's what you really have to play for. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good afternoon and welcome to another Walker webcast. Uh, it is my great pleasure to have my three colleagues, uh, Ivy Zellman, Chris Mickelson, and Aaron Appel join me today once again to try and give our listeners some insight into what's going on in the commercial real estate markets. Um, I have to say that um, we have typically not, if you will, brought WMDers onto the webcast to try and look for a third party uh, insight uh, to give our listeners sort of outside perspectives. And at the same time, uh, I have the great privilege of working with these three professionals every single day. And I must say that they are as insightful and as understanding of where the markets are as any three people that I come in contact with. Um, that is um, the only uh, self-promotion and uh, mm -hmm. pitch I will give today. And I will then move to my three guests so they can actually live up to uh, the expectations. Um, let me also, just as a quick intro, um, Ivy really needs no introduction. Um, over a decade ago, has been one of the leading um, research firms uh, as it relates to the housing industry, um, most particularly in the single family market, then moving into the multifamily market, and then covering extensively the single family rental and built for rent markets uh, over the past several years. Um, Chris Mickelson um, runs investment sales at Walker and Dunlop and has responsibility for um, our entire multifamily investment sales platform, which last year sold over $20 billion of properties across the country. Um, and Aaron Appel um, runs our New York Capital Markets Group, uh, as well as our institutional capital markets efforts across the country, um, working with large institutions on the financing, as well as the uh, equity and uh, uh, sale of institutional quality properties, uh, commercial real estate in every asset class, office retail, hospitality, and multifamily. So let me start here, Ivy. Um, your most recent publication did a survey of multifamily investor sentiment, uh, and there were two um, headlines that really uh, jumped out at me. Um, the first one is um, the cost of capital, the capital and uncertainty is hurting buyer demand in the multifamily market. And your survey came back with some pretty depressing numbers, quite honestly. Um, and then the other one was um, from an underwriting standpoint, the underwriting assumptions that many multifamily investors are making um, have gotten as negative as you've ever seen. Can you talk through those two surveys and what the general survey uh, came back with? Sure. And thanks for uh, having um, me on the webcast with you. Um, overall, our transaction survey, uh, the metrics were across uh, 12 years of data, probably some of the worst uh, metric results that we've seen. Um, the overall underwriting has definitely significantly changed, as you indicated, in terms of much more stringent underwriting and using much more conservative rent assumptions. And obviously, the demand side um, being hurt by the elevated cost of capital. That's, um, you know, feels like the transaction market has come to a bit of a halt. But good news is that with uh, the 10 year rallying and the cost of debt, you know, coming down in the 10 year now in the three and a half percent range, I think there, there might be some signs of price discovery and, and maybe um, indication there's, there's a slight increase in interest, but we'll have more to say after we survey our November overall uh, respondents, but the October numbers were no question pretty ugly. Chris, you're seeing the transaction market every single day. Uh, is that negative sentiment being seen pretty much across the board? My, my, my hope is that the October numbers that came out in the sentiment survey might have a little bit of a trailing effect to them. It's, it's been an exceedingly challenging six months, as I think everyone that's listening to this call knows. But I would agree with some of the findings from Ivy's report, particularly uh, around a couple of things. One, the seller supply index is very, very low right now. Um, we are we are transacting. We've awarded about 40 transactions over the course of the last 60 days. The average transaction size 
there is around $55 million. So we absolutely are getting things done. And I would say, Willie, if you asked me that question on October 15th, uh, with a 10 year in the four and a quarter range, feeling like it was never going to stop until five to five and a half versus what we see today, which just over the last two to three weeks, uh, we've priced about a dozen assets and we've started to see uh, a, a little bit of a floor forming and pricing. I've looked at a number of bid lists that have 10 to 15 names on the bid sheet. We recognize very, you know, most of these groups, you'll see 60 to 70% of those groups crowded around a two to 3% kind of band. You see a couple of groups 10% off that, but you see a few that are willing to step out two to 3% ahead of that pack. And we've been successful at really making markets and, and getting some price discovery really within the last two to three weeks that we frankly weren't able to find 45 days ago. So um, to your question about growth and some of these assumptions, um, I think back to where we were in the middle of August, where we had some green shoots with some CPI numbers rolling over and some positive job announcements or job reports, excuse me. Uh, and we had some optimism that really got removed in the middle part of September when the tenor from the Fed uh, was such that they were going to remain focused on a hawkish stance until they saw the hikes show up in employment figures. And I think the biggest difference for us over the course of the last 60 to 90 days, when we look at our expectations of value and when we go make a market, is the reining in of those growth assumptions has, has created some issues uh, over the course of the last 60 to 90 days uh, that, that have taken time to work through the system. Um, and that's really caused, you know, probably another leg down in value. But that was really kind of a September, October situation. And we feel like we're, you know, as we sit here on December 6th, we feel like we might be finding a little bit more consensus today. Aaron, both Ivy and Chris talked about capital availability as far as being one of the key drivers of why there's been both conservative underwriting as well as sluggish demand for the acquisitions market. Uh, we just rate locked today a $47.3 million floating rate loan with Freddie Mac at a 583% coupon rate. So the GSEs are still lending. Um, is the market in any way you know, transacting or is finding financing just like pulling teeth? No, I mean... <laughs> I think it depends on what you're doing. So, you know, for core core plus value add multifamily assets, there's there's plenty of liquidity. It just it costs more. So, um, I think it's a cost of funds issue relative to what what value is um, or or what people are willing to pay. Um, you know, people have a certain expected return, and um, they want to uh, uh, they want to achieve that return and you know, if the cost of, of, if their borrowing costs have increased substantially, then, you know, they, they need to pay less for the asset ultimately, uh, unless the revenues are going up and clearly <laughs> revenues seem to have frozen in most markets. Yeah. But so for instance, you just did a $204 million bridge loan on a property <laughs> in Brooklyn. I think it was 70% LTV, uh, cap rate was four and a half. Uh, but the coupon was, I think 840. Am I correct on that? Yeah, so the it's a two hundred million dollar loan. It's a property that's fifty percent leased. Uh, there's a small commercial component to it. Um, when it stabilizes, maybe it has a thirteen and a half million dollar net operating income, and it's a two hundred million dollar loan. So it's about a seven ish percent debt yield. The asset today in New York is probably worth about a five and a quarter uh, cap. So there's a good spread for the lender there um, in terms of value, um, you know, versus their loan amount. And that price that in the low four is over SOFR. So SOFR is 380 and it's got a low four handle spread on it. Um, that's a deal that at the beginning of this year would have priced at 250 to 275 over SOFR and SOFR was zero. So you're talking about 500 plus basis point increase in cost of capital. And how many lenders showed up for that? In other words, is that a was that a group of one or no, so there, four so there or five was, different lenders who showed up to be able to write so that loan? So at the proceed level on that particular transaction, there were three groups that showed up, and then there were another seven or eight that were maybe five to ten percent off the market in terms of the amount of levers they were willing to provide. 
So Ivy, the negative leverage we've been seeing in the market has been something that, you know, has obviously been of concern to many um, buyers. And um, your survey has been looking at rent growth and you all have been, you know, a lot of people have been saying, well, I can buy with negative leverage. <coughs> my, I have this outsized rent growth that many people were performing back in the summertime of six to 8% rent growth on an annualized basis. Um, are we seeing rent growth hold up at that level or have we seen that collapse with everything else? You know, I think that overall rent growth is actually holding up at those levels on the renewal basis. Um, I think that new move-ins is uh, definitely moderating at a faster rate, but they're capturing loss to lease today. And so there's no question renewals are are stickier. And I think we're in the kind of seven plus percent range. And our forecast right now, although we're updating our forecast for 23, 24, and, and do that we do that quarterly, is that we just see a moderation in, in blended rent growth more into like the historic range and actually a little bit above four and a half percent and then continued moderation in 24 to more like a two-ish percent growth rate. Now that's subject to change as we update our, our forecast, but I don't think we're as bearish as some with respect to their assumptions. I don't know, Chris is, and I chatted about it and there's some that are you know, looking for sort of flat line. Now, if we have a hard landing, I think it could be, obviously we could be too optimistic, but I think that overall the renewals are, are stickier and holding up better than uh, new move-in rates. Um, Ivy, how does the supply of single family and sort of the distress we're seeing in the single family market play into those assumptions? In other words, I think there are a lot of people sitting there going, there hasn't been an overhang of single family impacting rents on the multifamily side of things. But if, you know, prices get cut and single family inventory starts to move again, does that pull away from the rent rolls and therefore put downward pressure on those um, rents? You know, I think from the multifamily versus single family, we do think that shelter is shelter. And yet, you know, there's a lot of people within a class A uh, multifamily asset that might not be interested in living out in the tertiary uh, and looking at a, a single family rental for three bedroom home. But I do think that more competition, whether it be supply coming on from the build for rent operators or investors selling SFR in the existing market, and overall more supply and multifamily that's going to be delivered with completions, our expectation will continue to rise in 23. I think that competitive environment could put pressure more. And that's where, that's what we're reflecting in our expectation for rents to decelerate. And we're seeing that right now. But I think it's also really clear that you know affordability is stretched in the for sale market and builders are actually turning to uh, the rental market as a outlet to sell units on a scattered basis or whole communities. And I think that they're continuing to move forward on their um, overall plans and, and strategy to develop more lots for the rental market. So I, I would anticipate there's gonna be a lot more competition in the single family rental market as, and, and overall that you know could have some impact on multifamily, but not as much as crossover depending on, you know it's suburban class A, that might be more the area where you start to see people reconsider if they were in the market and they wanted to own and they've been renting and now the builders are offering them you know a much more attractive pricing it might compel them to to buy today because the pricing in some markets have have come down pretty sharply um and incentives are pretty compelling and they're offering substantial mortgage rate buy downs and base cut re, you know reductions as cancellation rates are also surging. So they're sitting on inventory that they need to move. Chris, you were going to jump in with something. Well, I've, Ivy mentioned their base case rent growth forecast that you know I, th I think is, is, is really pretty spot on. And I, I think we've observed a similar phenomenon where renewals seem to be holding up very well. Um, there's been a moderation of rent growth on new move-in rates. Um, but still, when you're taking a look at those rental rates relative to what's in the rent roll, it is still positive. I, I was sharing with Ivy as we were catching up before this call, my frustrations with some of the other third party providers. We took a look at an asset in a growth market in the southeast uh, just yesterday where one of the third party providers that a lot of institutional acquisition officers really need to take their assumptions and put them in their underwriting models because that's what research groups rely on took this asset uh, in the market from a, a four-year rent growth kegger, so not cumulative growth, 
but per year annual rent growth uh, of seven and a half percent in March. And they've revised that assumption down to a uh, sub 1% four year growth kicker. So just do nothing else other than follow this third party data provider, solve for the same returns, use the same residual cap rates at the end of your hold. That's a 30% correction to value. So, you know, I, I would say kind of shame on you if you were taking lock, stock and barrel that seven and a half percent revenue kegger assumption over the course of the next four years back in March. But it's hard to look at these in migration markets and say rents today are going to be the same at, you know, in the end of 2025 and early 2026, where they seem to have really kind of overcorrected to. So, Aaron, you've been funding a bunch of construction loans, I think, surprisingly, over the past month or two. Um, you just did a, a, a multi-construction loan in Brooklyn, no, in Salt Lake City, excuse me. And then you also did a very large mixed-use construction loan um, in, the, in, in, in Brooklyn uh, with, a, with what I saw as a very reasonable coupon. Um, who's still writing construction loans and, and, and what are some of the assumptions that you're seeing in those types of deals? Yeah, I mean, look, commercial banks um, for their best clients will still go out and write a write a loan on a on a one off basis. You know, there's not an abundance of liquidity in the development space whatsoever, and there's a lot of construction loans that are in the market right now, and developers looking for construction financing. And there's, you know, we would take on a lot more than we're currently working on right now. I would tell you that, you know, if a sponsor doesn't have a substantial enough balance sheet to be able to guarantee completion of the project and have the liquidity and financial wherewithal or partners within their transaction are going to go on a guarantee to provide liquidity for the construction line or those loans. We, we just don't think those loans are possible to get capitalized right now. So we're not interested in working on those, but um, you know, for, for good developers uh, with well-located real estate um, you know, there is some financing available. It's not particularly attractive. Um, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples or anecdotes. Um, beginning of the year for a loan that was just required to have a completion guarantee and a carry guarantee, but no principal recourse, you could borrow at 65% of cost at roughly 275 basis points to 300 basis points over SOFR. Um, today, that loan is somewhere in the, call it 50 to 55% of cost range and is in the mid threes to upper threes over SOFR. And you're looking at a SOFR that's now, you know, 400 basis points roughly. So you're talking about a decrease in leverage of 10% to 15% and an increase um, an increase in the cost of uh, uh, funds of, you know, call it, you know, 500 basis points. Uh, that, you know, makes a lot of these deals not work. Um, so, you know, it's challenging, but um, projects that have a low enough land basis or some sort of, uh, you know, creative mechanism to, to, to make the deal work can still get financed. So in that deal in Utah, we, we sold the fee to uh, 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 below the proposed building um, to uh, uh, Safehold, which is iStar's uh, fee purchasing vehicle and um, rolled that capital back, those sale proceeds back in uh, to the deal's additional equity and then did a leasehold construction loan and credit mer metrics worked well for the leasehold construction lender and and the return metrics worked work well for the sponsor and the deal in Brooklyn. That deal had a component of condominium in it that um, the deal on its own wouldn't work uh, from a return perspective. It's just a multifamily development uh, or justify the the investment. So uh, you're using some condominium sale proceeds to to recoup some of the equity in the transaction and wind up at a more appropriate or, or a more attractive yield on cost uh, for rental development. Um, you know, so that's what, why that happened. But we have some stuff going on in in uh, in South Florida. We have some transactions in Nashville, other markets that do work. And then we have deals in other markets where where, where development just doesn't work right now, where you can't make the uh, uh, the math work based on uh, inflation costs and, and cost of increased funds uh, and return requirements. Um, on, know, on that big on that big deal you did in in Brooklyn, the three hundred plus million dollar construction loan, you also brought in almost ninety million dollars of equity. Um, what kind of what kind of return was that ninety million bucks of JV equity looking for? So we had, we actually brought in it was it was over two hundred million dollars, but the first tranche was funded as a land acquisition, and then we had a 
we had a second tranche that funded at the closing. But I mean, look, they're looking for a, they're looking for a, um, you know, call it a, close to a 20 IRR and a, and a 2 multiple ultimately in that deal. What I will say that I find to be very interesting and, you know, call it the hundred meetings we've had in the last two months is, um, you know, I'll point out two things. Number one, um, I had lunch with a lender yesterday and uh, that, that runs up and he's in charge of a big mortgage REIT. And he said um, their cost to borrow. So they would write loans. They would write transitional loans on assets and they used to borrow on just take multifamily, for example. Uh, they would go and they borrow at uh, LIBOR or SOFR plus plus one fifty, and they put out money at LIBOR or SOFR plus two seventy five. And today their cost to borrow is SOFR plus three hundred. And they're putting out money at 350 or 375. So while on an all-in relative return, they're getting a better return on their money because SOFR has gone from zero to 400 on and you know from on a spread basis, they're making a lot less than they were. Um, there that gap is only 50 or 75 basis points. So I thought that was interesting. The other thing I find to be very, very interesting in the marketplace, I'm curious, Chris, to know what you have to say about this is the, you know, call it the the senior capital that's in the marketplace. Um, on anything sort of non-fully stabilized, wants to make roughly seven and a half to eight percent on their money right now, with where Sulfur is. And then the subordinate capital in the marketplace, when everybody we talk to, pretty much wants to be rescue capital or some sort of distressed angle or coming in and filling a capital stack that's you know maybe short or someone paying down a loan that doesn't have all the capital, and they want fifteen percent. And they want to attach somewhere in the 60, 65, 70% range. And they want to go to anywhere from 75 to 85. So if those guys want 15 or 16, yeah. you know, the equity, theoretically speaking, should want 25, right? And, um, you know, therein lies the problem in the marketplace right now. Makes it hard to figure out how to sell four caps. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. But look, I look. I would so, say so, that. So, so what I would say to that, Aaron, is first off, very few of those deals are getting done right now. Agreed. Um, and and I would say when you look at what is clearing in the market, and this is a multifamily specific comment, but what is clearing in the market is largely clearing what with what I would just refer to as able to sellers, and those able to sellers largely have de risked assets. Um, and they're they're selling to very well capitalized private groups and close in funds that can operate with lower leverage. So they're not gearing up those capital stacks with the type of capital that you just outlined. Um, you know, we were on this call six months ago and we were incredibly active still in the forward transaction market. That that space is is completely mute. You went from Merchant developers basically finding buyers and committing to deals six months before they were complete to now recognizing that they have to deliver those assets, they have to execute on the business plan, they have to de-risk the rent roll, and then it's ready to go take to market. And there might be one or two exceptions to that rule that are that are very situational and specific, but that is the general rule today. And uh, really, that's what you need to be able uh, to go find more reasonably priced senior uh, and, uh, and and equity that is able to get to a price that that works for the seller. Chris, I looked through that list of the 40 transactions that have taken place in the last 60 days, um, and it seemed like a pretty even break between private capital and institutional capital. But it also feels from having looked at the list that private capital is transacting more than institutional of late. Is that sure. a fair is that a fair read of where the capital is coming from and who's actually getting stuff done? I, I think that's right. I, I think within the institutional capital description, Willie, I think you we should be um, we should be very specific there. The institutions that we're transacting with are operating almost exclusively in closed in vehicles that are not subject to quarterly mark to markets or they're operating with separate account capital. Since June 1st of this year, we've awarded over well over 100 transactions. Not a single transaction has been awarded to an open-ended fund or perpetual life vehicle of any kind. And I would include the non-traded REITs 
uh, in, in that in that observation. So let's just, I do want to come to you on a couple of things, but let me just, this is a perfect time for us to just dive into the B read and S read uh, halting redemptions or limiting redemptions in both of those vehicles. That's the news of the last week. Um, does, does that, what's your read on that, Chris, to the extent that um, the gates were put in place on purpose? Both these vehicles have been great in an up market. Um, everyone's sort of new in a down market wouldn't be great. My general read of it has been if you look at the publicly traded REITs, they're all off between 20 and 40 percent in value. If you can go and redeem at par at NAV right now in one of these private vehicles, um, you can basically get an ARB on where you think the value is going to go on those. And therefore, there are a lot of people redeeming on them right now. Is that a, is that a fair read or is that an incorrect read? No, I, I would just say that, you know, we saw this in 2008 and 2009 with the large open-ended core funds with, with, with big redemption queues. Um, those gates are there to serve a purpose. And I think those gates largely protect shareholders of non-traded REITs and LPs of these open-ended vehicles. Um, you know, forced liquidations and resetting of values don't help anyone. And so keeping uh, you know, that sale activity to create liquidity, to fund those redemptions uh, at an orderly pace uh, so as to not overwhelm the market with product, I think is the responsible thing to do. I think, um, you know, there was an understanding going into some of those non-traded REIT vehicles that there's a reason why they were non-traded REITs and, and, and not public REITs and, you know, daily liquidity. And, and uh, so I think what you're seeing right now is a little bit of uh, of the result of that but in the meantime while those gates are up the investors of those REITs should feel very good about the neighborhoods that those groups have been investing in and the cash flow that those assets are generating and their ability to cover those dividends but you know whether it's a non-traded REIT or an open-ended fund Willie for those groups to come back off the sidelines and start to play offense again they will have to recognize write downs they will have to meet the market. Um, they need trades to have the clarity of where the market actually is to accurately reflect today's NAV. Uh, but they will have to make some of those realizations and uh, make it attractive for new capital to come in, and, and it'll take some time. Um, but overall, those are still great vehicles with a lot of longevity to them. I would just, I would also point out that, you know, commercial real estate. Um, has been a fantastic hedge against inflation historically. Um, unfortunately, right now with the with the swiftness of rate increases, we're going through a bit of a re revaluation period of of you know real estate assets. I think we're going through that reevaluation period across the board against all asset classes. Um, no question. It doesn't it's all one trade, and it doesn't really matter what it is. It's all getting reevaluated based on just cost of funds. Um, once that reevaluation takes place and stabilizes and we have a base set on where rates are going to be, and maybe they do come down, maybe they sort of stay where they are. So long as you can hold on, the beauty of real estate is it, it will protect you against inflation. And the rents historically will always go up because the Fed is always going to print more money. And so long as you buy quality assets in good markets, um, that don't, you know, have, you know, you know that the city that you're investing in is not collapsing and losing massive amounts of population. Theoretically speaking, those assets should always increase in value. So the time that you have, you can you can grow your way out of those problems. And Aaron, I, I would uh, just say to that, Chris, if I can, can, okay, I, okay. Can, can I just jump over to Ivy on something here? So both, you know, Aaron was just talking about inflation and inflationary pressures. The the you know the the big question now is when does the Fed stop raising and, and when do these inflationary pressures kind of get out of the market? You all track the building products market very closely. Um, are you seeing any relief on the inflationary pressures that have been seen throughout the building products market start to kind of ripple their way through to the point where A, construction costs are starting to come down and B, those inflationary pressures as it relates to you know goods um, are seeing some relief? The trades right now are seeing less work in many of the MSAs that were hot and are recognizing uh, that activity is slowing so that they're being more willing to 
uh, work with builders and and reduce price in some of the front end part of the cycle. On the back end, where there is a lot of inventory that needs to be completed, um, I think that there's less willingness yet. So that it's it's much more uh, category specific. But I think if you just look at overall expense growth, uh, we've seen moderation in expense growth and overall costs that have moderated but are still elevated. So I think that we're we're definitely seeing um, a benefit to the slowing, and we continue to expect that those costs are going to come down. I think that you know Toll Brothers just reported earnings after the close, and they indicated that they are seeing some cost relief, and I, I would expect that that will continue. I think the backlogs for a single family right now are still very elevated and, and a significant portion of that is spec inventory. So as we see that spec inventory get delivered, it completed and delivered in the first half of 23, I think once we start to see um, less of that benefit from the backlog, you're gonna see that all points of the construction cycle from, from the trades are gonna have to um, be willing to give up price. And we're not seeing as much really price increases from uh, manufacturers and distributors. They're not pushing for incremental price. Um, they're kind of holding and getting a little more um, stickier as they think about you know, the growth that they know is coming from the backlog. But I do think the front end of the cycle, you're seeing some benefits. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I want to just quickly, I want to re read a text that I received this morning because I'm building a house and <laughs> I, I do a foundation now. Um, and I asked a friend of mine who builds houses, um, in, uh, Long Island. And I said to him, uh, uh, he's got a lot of houses under construction. I said to him, Hey, uh, you know, what are you seeing on the cost side? Because I'm currently in the process of buying out the job with the contractor and signing all the subs. And he said, materials are down somewhat, but labor is all the same. Subs are especially busy in the high end of the market still. So we haven't seen any sort of reset in prices due to uh, due to the labor shortages that are still out there. So I think that we will see substantial decreases, and but I think that you're going to see them. I think you're going to have to wait another six months to see them personally. I think the one thing I'd add, though, Aaron, is that where you have very large scale builders that benefit from scale, they they're, they have more negotiation power. So the smaller the builder, the less likely that they're going to see some relief. But the largest guys are definitely um, talking with their trades and working together to come up with, you know, what would be more attractive pricing, knowing how much leverage they have. Yeah, I was I was going to make the comment to anyone listening, <laughs> put a big asterisk next to what Appel just said, because the labor market in Southampton, New York and Aspen, Colorado is very different from Nashville, Tennessee and Austin, Texas. It's the so only one I care about. I, I just I just want to be clear there. Ivy's data is a far better benchmark to where the labor markets are than Aaron's anecdote from his builder this morning. Um, hey, last 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 last, mention, last call we got last call we got is color from this guy that bought a million eggs, and now we're getting you know the foundation guy in Southampton. Listen, though, Aaron might be right. The luxury market, you know, super luxury, which I put you in, Aaron, that category, is is definitely still pretty active, and and I think that you know. The lower price points where the production builders and and the just for the you know audience, the public home builders account for almost 50% of the market. And you know, very much a production builder uh segment, the lowest uh, end of that price point is actually holding up in some markets despite affordability being so stretched. If you can build in the you know, threes and you're selling townhouses in certain parts of the country are actually seeing uh, the country, you're actually seeing pretty decent absorption, needing incentives, you know, mortgage rate buy downs. But, you know, the middle of the market is where it's most challenged. But even framers are, are you know, willing to negotiate and drywallers and just knowing that they they need the work. And so you are seeing, you know, some of those subs willing to, you know, offer better pricing to their large scale builders. I would, I just add uh, to the cost conversation, Ivy's got great insight onto the for sale side, a number of developers who were able to capitalize their projects, get equity on board, keep the construction lender at the table, closing those projects over the last 60 days. We've really heard for the first time that the numbers that they started to carry in the first or second quarter of the year for that development project have held all the way through GMP. And in some of those instances, 
marginal savings. You know, this is not significant numbers, but getting to the end of the $70 million total capitalization and, and having an extra million and a half dollars left uh, in the hard cost number once they finally get that GMP uh, from their contractor. So um, I think we've seen a little bit of good news there. It's it's really just a reprieve from what was, you know, 150 basis points per month worth of, worth of cost inflation that they've been running with since yeah. middle, the middle part of 2020. And I don't think we're going to go back substantially the other way. I think we could go back a bit, though, because I just look at all the projects that, you know, we see, and we're just a small segment of the market. Um, so many of them we don't think are going to get capitalized that are planned out there. So it's just a matter of time, we think, before, um, you know, depending on the market you're in, so just figure it out. So Aaron, on that, do, do banks come back into the market? So banks have basically, particularly the money center banks, have basically been out of the market since mid-August. Um, and what that's done is, A, slowed down construction dollars, but more importantly, it slowed down the liquidity to the secondary market which has made it so that there's really no buyer in the secondary market of paper, which has made it so that spreads have gapped out. Um, and so until the money center banks get back in there and provide that kind of liquidity, it's very hard to think about the general capital markets for commercial real estate getting back up and getting back to where they need to be. Do you think that we get to January 1 and the money center banks step back into the market? So look, they're not, they're not all completely out of the market. You know, we're still able to get things done, but I would tell you normally in a normalized market, 60 to 70 percent of capital allocations are contributed, whether it's from investment banks or insurance companies or commercial banks or on the equity side, you know, a variety of different equity investors. They're typically made in the first and second quarter of the year. That's where there's a plethora of liquidity is. Uh, and then it slows in the summer and then people sit there in September and and, um, you know, they try to cherry pick what they're willing to do. And if, you know, they're able to win deals with wider pricing or, you know, low paying less for it, great. And if they're not, they sort of, you know, will dump that money into the market right around now, um, you know, or right, you know, around November is the last gaps to meet their quotas. Um, you know, I, I am very suspect about seeing new capital come in in January 23. I think we're going to see more of this. My personal take is, from talking to people is the, the the financial system is having an issue right now. The biggest issue in the financial system is the public markets are not working properly. There's not there's no buyers for for bonds right now, um, and uh, specifically commercial real estate bonds. There's a lot of talk that bonds are the best place to be going forward in the the next twelve to eighteen months, and I think they're a good place to be. But there doesn't seem to be a big demand at all for for securitized. Uh, commercial mortgage bonds right now. And uh, I think that's a big problem. And until the public markets open up and you see some stability and, you know, part of the issue is there's a lot of instability. So you really don't know what, a, what a deal is going to price until the day the bonds sell. And it makes it hard for the banks to write loans. Also, um, you need, you need the public markets to be open to absorb the large loans. And then, you know, some of the stuff that's on bank balance sheets can get off their balance sheets into the public markets uh, where it was meant to be, and then you have capital allocations that free up to lend. So I think that's a big problem. And also, I think that the the marks on the treasuries that a lot of these banks hold with customer deposits is also had them fail their stress tests and has created downward pressure as well. Yeah, uh, I, I would think clarity. that you get some clearing of that in the new year, and particularly with budgets for 2023, the ability to kind of move some of that paper that is now underwater. But I'd be on the I mean, given how depressed the single family mortgage market is, and all these money center banks have massive single family mortgage origination uh, uh, platforms, they're not getting that. They're not writing CNI loans today. Isn't there a sense that they've got to earn NIM somewhere and that they're going to have to come back into the markets to some degree starting in 2023? Or is that just wishful thinking on my part? You know, I think right now the mortgage market is, you know, probably the most challenged part of our ecosystem with, you know, refi is basically non-existent and purchases uh, basically originations are down at you know, 40 plus percent. We've seen some modest improvement as rates have come down sequentially. We've seen a pickup a little bit, but really just getting less worse, I guess, from a very depressed level. Um, it's tough to say where you're right. Where are they going to get NIM from and recognizing that today, you know, our our view is that, you know, it's somewhat dependent on what rates do going forward. And I think it, it's a very challenging environment. 
and they're not really not lending as much. They're much more stringent in underwriting as it relates to any uh, development in the single family market as they are in the new, you know, in the, in the multifamily market. So they pulled back substantially. I would make the case that the cost of capital right now that's available in the marketplace is more expensive than it's ever been. Maybe I'm look, I'm 41 years old. So maybe since the early eighties, um, because, you know, even though the coupon is not as high as some of those eye popping mid teen uh, coupons, you, the leverage is just so low relative to historical standards um, and historical norms. I, it's just so conservative. There's such an ungodly fear factor out there that like, you know, 2008 is going to happen all over again. Um, and the marketplace is completely different. The dynamics are completely different. Um, and, um, you know, I, I did, it just, it's skewed so far, uh, you know, the other way. Um, you know, when you're talking about 50% leverage at seven and a half percent coupons and 8% coupons for development, you know, that that's, you know, you, you would, you were borrowing it at, at that price at 85% leverage, 90% leverage back in 2007 and 2008. It's right. just a titanic difference. Yeah. Chris, you've been, your, your team's been selling a bunch on the, on the build for rent front. I just saw a number of, of prints on, on some inventory that you've sold there. Has that market corrected as much as the multi-market has less more and ivy i want to come to you on your outlook on sfr bfr because that that's sort of i mean without a doubt that was the hottest space in housing kind of across the spectrum for the last you know year or two um has has the has some of the air come out of that or is it still holding up pretty well the the capital formation and the capital deployment continues it, it's it's largely centered in the build the core strategy, though, Willie, um, you, you've 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 seen large institutional investors continue to deploy capital, but it's 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 really to to build and own this durable income stream for the next eight to ten years. The transaction space and build for rent in particular was almost exclusively in the forward takeout structure because a lot of this inventory just hadn't been delivered. Um, so we went from you know, forward takeout structures in the low to mid four stabilized cap rate range in the fourth quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2022 to now those stabilized yields need to comfortably have six handles on them, if not, you know, into the mid sixes. Um, and there's very, very little transaction activity. I made the comment to Ivy earlier. I said, I feel like you've got transactions on stabilized cash flowing existing communities at market prices. And then you've got distressed home builders selling to opportunistic builders in the forward space on the other end of the spectrum and very little transaction activity, acquisition activity in between the middle of those two poles right now. But we are seeing, you know, build and hold continue For sure. to um, move forward. And I think that there's a lot of optimism, Willie, that there's a shortage of shelter and therefore, you know, if the builders, built, developers develop and, you know, looking forward to, you know, the um, expectation that we have, you know, the need at, at with a stretched affordability, there's more of a um, directional play to go to build for rent by many developers that might have been otherwise, you know, considering for sale. So I think that there's a lot, lot more optimism towards that asset class than the for sale market right now. Um, just to, just to put into a perspective, but I think the build and hold um, side is still pretty positive. And Ivy, I remember about a year ago, you were talking about the fact that both single family developers and then also BFR developers were getting a little over their skis as it relates to land, that some of the bidding that was going on to buy land was kind of getting super frothy. Um, that was obviously one of the precursors to the 2008 great financial crisis. Are you seeing any issues as it relates to, you know, people having overpaid for land and 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 then some kind of distressed sales going on to the market now of people saying, I'm not going to develop this? Well, no question that lot inflation just soared. At the peak, we were seeing lots, you know, in some markets doubling in value. Um, developers were the winners here. And, you know, overall nationally, we do a land development survey quarterly. Um, and we had a uh, lot inflation approaching 35, 40% nationally with, as I said, many markets seeing more uh, doubling of that. 
And, you know, the land developers in our survey indicated that, you know, a good 40% of that inflation was due to the build for rent capital chasing the asset class. That's a since mo moderated to uh, lot inflation more in the low, let's say 10 plus percent. And I think it will continue to moderate given um, the weakness in the market. But I do think that, you know, comparing it to the GFC, I would just say that, you know, at least on the for sale side, builders have been much more prudent tying up lots via option in smaller bites than they did in the GFC. And just order of magnitude, there's a, there's a lot in their balance sheets that are a lot that's not on the balance sheet that they're retrading now. And so they're, you know, going back and dealing with the developer that they're optioning lots from. And they're either uh, walking away and taking impairments on those um, deposits, those options that they have locked right now, and they're deciding they don't want them or they're retrading them at better values. So it's it's really not the GFC in our opinion today. If you told me we're going to have a hard landing and the economy is going to sink into a recession, I think that we're going to see more significant impairments. But right now, they've been fairly modest. So I want to finish with kind of, if you will, what's the smart money doing today? Um, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of smart money out there that may not have the ability to move right now because of certain capitalization issues, redemptions, things of that nature. But as you as you sit there today and say, okay, that was a really smart move that someone did to either um, harvest capital, hold on to capital, make a big bet right now that others it's somewhat contrarian. Um, what do you what are you seeing in the market that where the smart money is going beyond just sitting on the sidelines? So let me let me put that as one caveat on this. I want to hear what people are actually doing, not just standing on the sidelines. Chris, let me start with you. There was an asset that closed uh, at the end of the week last week, full disclosure, we did not work on, on, on the project, but it was acquired by what I would generally consider probably one of the savvier opportunistic investors in the market. Uh, it was an asset that was put under agreement in the first quarter. Uh, let's say it got put under agreement for a dollar in the first quarter. Uh, new construction, core, high growth market. Um, you know, the the basis was very attractive. It's, it's called the basis at fifty cents, and 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 this group actually went in and acquired the asset that closed last Friday. It's sixty five cents, so a thirty five percent discount off of peak pricing in March of twenty twenty two. I don't think the story is 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 really how much that value has fallen off. I think it's a reversion to the mean story and a story about how far that value ran. From when that development project was capitalized to where the peak pricing was in the first quarter. I have no idea what rents are going to do in that market over the course of the next three to five years. And candidly, I don't think anyone else really does. It's a great neighborhood. It's a growth market, ton of in-migration, ton of employment growth. They just bought a phenomenal basis in the right location. And they've got the ability to hold that asset for the next five to 10 years. They did a 10-year floating rate this group has been doing 10-year floating rate debt and then hedging out uh, or swapping uh, the rate for the first five years to get them on the other side of uh, of the turbulence uh, in the rate environment. So I think that's a pretty smart play, and they've been ahead of the puck more often than not. So um, that one caught my eye. I would say... Oh, sorry. Uh, Ivy, go ahead. You take it. Go I ahead, was Ivy. just going to say that... Um, you know, the M&A activity, as we know, um, across the board has been pretty much non-existent. And I think that um, smart money right now is taking advantage of the weaker players in the market that are not well capitalized. Uh, DR Horton announced a small acquisition in Fayetteville today, and I imagine they probably got this, uh, this builder at a pretty attractive price. So I think that there's, you know, no question to capitalize on you know, those companies that are not well positioned, they have too much leverage and take advantage of what would be good locations uh, would be what smart money is doing today, I think. And Aaron? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you know, historically multifamily has been somewhere around like 35-ish percent of the investment sales market, maybe 40. I think going forward, it's going to be 50% of the marketplace permanently. Uh, there's obviously a fundamental issue in a lot of the um, a lot of the asset classes within the office sector um and you know people have been you know for years now uh turned off by retail to to you know a big extent so 
um, that leaves you with industrial, multifamily, and you know a little bit of hospitality, which is just not a huge market. And then you know some of the specialty uses like data centers or life science or or self storage. Um, but you know I would say that the smart money should be looking to be able to buy multifamily um, at break even leverage based on right around where today's rates are. Uh, and to lock in what I would deem to be seven-year financing with the ability to get out after five. Um, the Fed may increase rates and bring sulfur above 5% for a period of time or the federal funds rate, but 50% of the outstanding governmental debt has got an average duration of seven years or less. 15% rolls every 12 months. We have $32 trillion of debt. We generate $4 trillion of tax revenue, and we spend a little bit over $6 trillion a year. We're printing two and change a year, um, you know, $2.2 $2 trillion a year or so, uh, regardless. And that's going to continue to increase. The Fed cannot, cannot hold rates at a high, high level for an extended period of time. So it's just, it's just a waiting game, really. If you can buy it, break even leverage and good rental markets where there's going to be uh, demand drivers and eventual employment drivers back in the horizon and uh, the, you know, some level of supply constraint, I think you're going to be a huge winner five, six years from now. And that's what you really have to play for. Uh, but I think there's tremendous opportunity there. Chris, last word. I would just point out, I, I went back and listened to the archive and six months ago, Appel made a prediction about the Fed's activity that when compared to the guests that you had the week after our call, and I'll say no more than that, other than the fact that he had more letters after his name than I think are in the alphabet, um, to say that Appel was more directionally accurate, I think would be the understatement of this Zoom call. So um, congrats on getting that call correct, Aaron. And uh, you know, hopefully you're correct about the prediction that you just made. I thought you were going to take a shot at me with Bitcoin. So no, I, yeah, right? No, we didn't go there today. We didn't go there today. Jamie Diamond did that this morning, talking about his pet rocks. Uh, so uh, I would just go back to what I said at the beginning. I am so blessed to work with the three of you on a daily basis. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights on the market. To everyone who joined us today, thank you for tuning in, and we will be back next week with another Walker webcast. Um, I hope everyone has a great day. And uh, Ivy, Chris, and Aaron, thank you three for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you are the best. Bye.